Chapter 34 The Saragasso Sea That day the Nautilus crossed the singular part of the Atlantic Ocean. No one can be ignorant of the existence of a current of warm water known by the name of the Gulf Stream. After leaving the Gulf of Mexico about the 25th degree of north latitude, this current divides into two arms, the principal one going toward the coast of Ireland and Norway, while the second bends to the south about the height of the Azores, then touching the African shore and describing a lengthened oval, returns to the Antilles. This second arm, it is rather a collar than an arm, surrounds with its circles of warm water that portion of the cold, quiet, immovable ocean called the Saragasso Sea. A perfect lake in the open Atlantic. It takes no less than three years for the great current to pass round it. Such was the region the Nautilus was now visiting. A perfect meadow, a close carpet of seaweed, fucus, and tropical berries so thick and so compact that the stem of a vessel could hardly tear its way through it. And Captain Nemo, not wishing to entangle his screw in this herbaceous mass, kept some yards beneath the surface of the waves. The name Saragasso comes from the Spanish word sargazzo, which signifies kelp. This kelp, or varec, or berry plant, is the principal formation of this immense bank. And this is the reason, according to the learned Mori, the author of The Physical Geography of the Globe, why these hydrophytes unite in the peaceful basin of the Atlantic. The only explanation which can be given, he says, seems to me to result from the experience known to all the world. Place in a vase some fragments of cork or other floating body and give to the water in the vase a circular movement. The scattered fragments will unite in a group in the center of the liquid surface, that is to say, in the part least agitated. In the phenomenon we are considering, the Atlantic is the vase, the Gulf Stream, the circular current, and the Saragasso Sea, the central point at which the floating bodies unite. I share Maury's opinion, and I was able to study the phenomenon in the very midst where vessels rarely penetrate. Above us floated products of all kinds, heaped up among these brownish plants, trunks of trees torn from the Andes or the Rocky Mountains, and floated by the Amazon or the Mississippi. Numerous wrecks, remains of keels or ship's bottoms, side planks stove in and so weighted with shells and barnacles that they could not again rise to the surface and time will one day justify Mori's other opinion that these substances, thus accumulated for ages, will become petrified by the action of the water and will then form inexhaustible coal mines, a precious reserve prepared by far-seeing nature for the moment when men shall have exhausted the mines of continents. In the midst of this inextricable mass of plants and seaweed I noticed some charming pink halcyons and actinae, with their long tentacles trailing after them, medusae, green, red and blue, and the great rhyostoms of Cuvier, the large umbrella of which was bordered and festooned with violet. All the day of the 22nd of February we passed in the Saragasso Sea, where such fish are as partial to marine plants and fuci find abundant nourishment. The next, the ocean had returned to its accustomed aspect. From this time, for 
19 days from the 23rd of February to the 12th of March, the Nautilus kept in the middle of the Atlantic carrying us at a constant speed of a hundred leagues in 24 hours. Captain Nemo evidently intended accomplishing his submarine program, and I imagine that he intended, after doubling Cape Horn, to return to the Australian seas of the Pacific. Ned Land had cause for fear. In these large seas, void of islands, we could not attempt to leave the boat, nor had we any means of opposing Captain Nemo's will. Our only course was to submit. But what we could neither gain by forcing nor cunning, I like to think might be obtained by persuasion. This voyage ended. Would he not consent to restore our liberty under an oath never to reveal his existence? An oath of honor, which we should have religiously kept. But we must consider that delicate question with the captain. But was I free to claim this liberty? Had he not himself said from the beginning, in the firmest manner, that the secret of his life extracted from him our lasting imprisonment on board the Nautilus? And would not my four month silence appear to him a tacit acceptance of our situation, and would not a return to the subject result in raising suspicions which might be hurtful to our projects if at some future time a favorable opportunity offered to return to them? During the nineteen days mentioned above, no incident of any note happened to signalize our voyage. I saw little of the captain. He was at work. In the library I often found his books left open, especially those on natural history. My work on submarine depths, conned over him, was covered with marginal notes, often contradicting my theories and systems, but the captain contented himself with thus purging my work. It was very rare for him to discuss it with me. Sometimes I heard the melancholy tones of his organ, but only at night, in the midst of the deepest obscurity, when the Nautilus slept upon the deserted ocean. During this part of our voyage, we sailed whole days on the surface of the waves. The sea seemed abandoned. A few sailing vessels on the road to India were making for the Cape of Good Hope. One day we were followed by the boats of a whaler who, no doubt, took us for some enormous whale of great price. But Captain Nemo did not wish the worthy fellows to lose their time and trouble, so ended the chase by plunging under the water. Our navigation continued until the 13th of March. That day, the Nautilus was employed in taking soundings, which greatly interested me. We had then made about 13,000 leagues since our departure from the high seas of the Pacific. The bearings gave us 45 degrees 37 minutes south latitude and 37 degrees 53 minutes west longitude. It was the same water in which Captain Parker of the American Frigate Congress could not touch the bottom with 15,140 yards. Captain Nemo intended seeking the bottom of the ocean by a diagonal sufficiently lengthened by means of lateral planes placed at an angle of 45 degrees with the waterline of the Nautilus. Then the screw set to work at its maximum speed, its four blades beating the waves with indescribable force. Under this powerful pressure, the hull of the Nautilus quivered like a sonorous chord and sank regularly under the water. At 7,000 fathoms I saw some blackish tops rising from the midst of the waters. But these summits 
might belong to high mountains like the Himalayas or Mount Blanc, even higher, and the depth of the abyss remained incalculable. The Nautilus descended still lower in spite of the great pressure. I felt the steel plates tremble at the fastenings of the bolts, its bars bent, its partitions groaned. The windows of the saloon seemed to curve under the pressure of the waters, and this firm structure would doubtless have yielded if, as the captain had said, it had not been capable of resistance like a solid block. In skirting the declivity of these rocks lost under the water, I still saw some shells, some serpule and spine orbs still living, and some specimens of asteriots. But soon this last representative of animal life disappeared, and at the depth of more than three leagues, the Nautilus had passed the limits of submarine existence, even as a balloon does when it rises above the respirable atmosphere. We had attained a depth of 16,000 yards, that is, four leagues, and the sides of the Nautilus then bore a pressure of 1,000 six hundred atmospheres, that is to say, three thousand two hundred pounds to each square two-fifths of an inch of its entire surface. What a situation to be in, I exclaimed, to overrun these deep regions where man has never trod. Look, Captain, Look at these magnificent rocks, these uninhabited grottoes, these lowest receptacles of the globe, where life is no longer possible. What unknown sights are here! Why should we be unable to preserve a remembrance of them? Would you like to carry away more than the remembrance? said Captain Nemo. What do you mean by those words? I mean to say that nothing is easier than to take a photographic view of this submarine region. I had not time to express my surprise at this new proposition when, at Captain Nemo's call, an objective was brought into the saloon. Through the widely opened panel, the liquid mass was bright with electricity, which was distributed with such uniformity that not a shadow, not a gradation was to be seen in our manufactured light. The Nautilus remained motionless, the force of its crew subdued by the inclination of its planes. The instrument was propped on the bottom of the oceanic site, and in a few seconds we had obtained a perfect negative, from which may be seen those primitive rocks which have never looked upon the light of heaven, that lowest granite which forms the foundation of the globe, those deep grottoes woven in the stony mass whose outlines were of such sharpness, and the border lines of which are marked in black, as if done by the brush of some Flemish artist. Beyond that again, a horizon of mountains, an admirable undulating line forming the perspective of the landscape. I cannot describe the effect of these smooth black polished rocks without moss, without a spot, and of strange forms standing solidly on the sandy carpet which sparkled under the jets of our electric light. But the operating being over, Captain Nemo said, Let us go up. We must not abuse our position, nor expose the Nautilus too long to such great pressure. Go up again, I exclaimed. Hold well on, 
I had not time to understand why the captain cautioned me thus when I was thrown forward on to the carpet. At a signal from the captain, its screw was shipped and its blades raised vertically. The Nautilus shot into the air like a balloon, rising with stunning rapidity and cutting the mass of waters with a sonorous agitation. Nothing was visible, and in four minutes it had shot through the four leagues which separated it from the ocean, and after emerging like a flying fish, fell, making the waves rebound to an enormous height.